Okay, we're continuing our lesson, and we're basically we're um, in verse 14. So let's continue on. So to receive those to whom Jesus had sent is to receive Jesus himself. And uh, I wanted to look at some passages here. Look at Matthew 10, verse 40. Yeah, he who receives you receives me. He who receives me receives him who sent me. So if you receive the apostles, you receive Jesus. If you receive Jesus, you receive the Father, right? So that's something we need to recognize. Now, going into verses 15 and 16, and that's a, that's a good lesson for us today, right? Um, you know, I think about maybe Samuel sometimes. Remember Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 8? Um, you think about how he was really saddened when the people wanted a nation, uh, wanted a king like all the other nations, right? You remember where he went to God with this? And you remember what God said to him? God said to Samuel, he said, they haven't rejected you, Samuel, but they have rejected me uh, from being king that I should reign over them. Um, so we need to recognize that when people don't receive the gospel, they're not, don't think of them just as rejecting you. You need to think about they're rejecting Jesus. They're rejecting the Father. That's really sad. People are rejecting God. We're going on. Uh, verses 15 and 16. What then uh, was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that if possible you have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? This is really interesting what ha what, what's happening here. So, Paul wonders what happened to their positive attitude towards him. You know, you you once welcomed me. You you once received me in such a great, uh, such a good light. What happens to the blessings they once welcomed? They consider themselves blessed to have Paul with them, right? They consider themselves to be blessed when they obey the gospel. Therefore, by leaving the gospel for Judaism, what are they doing? They're rejecting the notion that they have been blessed by obeying the gospel. And that's something for us to consider, too. Because uh, Ephesians 1 verse 3 says, All spiritual blessings are in Christ. All spiritual blessings. And if I reject Christ, if I reject Jesus and his church, what am I doing? I'm rejecting the spiritual blessings. And one of those blessings is salvation. So we need to be really cautious about um how the devil is trying to go about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Look at verse 15. Uh, for I bear you witness, that if possible, you would have get plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. They were so thankful of Paul that they would have sacrificed for him. Isn't that, isn't that uh, interesting? The willingness to give their eyes to Paul led some to believe that Paul maybe have had this eye disorder, which is indeed possible. Um, in fact, it's said that the eye is viewed as the most precious part of the physical body. This plucking out the eyes can be used as a metaphor to illustrate great sacrifice. So presently, the Galatians, you know, here, here they are. They, had, they welcomed Paul at the very first. They were willing to sacrifice for him. But now they're treating Paul as if he's an enemy, right? They hate Paul. They're turning against him. And I think it's really interesting here. But Paul says, Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? You know, that's a that's a powerful statement. That's a powerful sermon to preach there. And um, there's just something there that that's a good application for us today. Friend, don't ever stop preaching the true gospel. Unfortunately, you are going to make enemies. That's just the truth of the matter. You are going to make enemies. Um, you know, Jesus said, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. Jesus, in a sense, he came, I mean, there is a sense that he came to divide the light from the darkness. Um, so Jesus, he made enemies too by what, by what? By preaching the truth. Now, we're to speak the truth in love. We're to 
do what's best for our neighbor, and the best for our neighbor is wanting them to go to heaven, right? So you're not going to be soft on the gospel. Don't be soft on the gospel. Don't, uh, you know, I think some of us have sadly, um, we are not very firm. We are not, um, we're very vague, so to speak, and we need to be more courageous and be, uh, and have the courage to speak the truth in love. So then, he, Paul's appeal is based on his past and present relationship uh, with the Galatians. So, verses 17 through 20. They zealously court you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you, that you may be zealous for them. But it is good to be zealous in a good thing always, and not only when I am present with you. My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you, I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. So, notice here, the Galatians showed zeal for him when he was there, but now they're not showing the right kind of zeal, right? And unfortunately, you have these Judaizing teachers. You have these false teachers who are zealous toward the Galatians. Now, this is very interesting about the word zeal. The word zeal can be used in a good or a bad way. Um, I want us to read, um, look at 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. So it says, uh, Paul says, uh, I'll begin with verse, yeah, verse 2. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now that is the right kind of jealousy we ought to have. You know, God in the Old Test Testament is called a jealous God. And there's a reason for that. God, uh, he, there's a God was married to Israel in the Old Testament, so he did not want them committing spiritual adultery with these idols. So he had the right to be jealous because he loves them. He wants them to be in that exclusive, special relationship with them. And same way today, God wants us to be in an exclusive relationship with him and we should not want to participate in the world and, and be a part of the worldly system um so there is this kind of jealousy that is right to have but then there's this other kind of jealousy right um there's a jealousy for example of um I guess I'm thinking of maybe Cain. You know, Cain seemed to be jealous of his brother Abel, right? Um, so he had the wrong kind of jealousy, and he even that led to him to killing his brother, which is sad. Um, so the the zeal of these Judaizers is not well, the New King James. It's not good. It's not commendable. It's not for a good purpose. See, um, I guess, I, you know, they zealously court you. You know, um, you think about, uh, of course, I don't know what um, in America, um, well, never mind, I'm, I'm not going to get into that. Uh <laughs> Zeal, zeal may mean here that they these Judaizing teachers they're envious of the Galatians liberty in Christ or relationship with Paul and thus they want to destroy that by bringing them into bondage so zeal means here that they're pretending to be deeply concerned about the Galatians in order to win them and and sadly bring them into bondage is what they're doing um yeah, maybe I'll try to bring this. Uh, so let's just say, uh, I'll think about American context here. So in American, we got what's called dating. Um, so you'll have a young man who 
to uh, to date a, a young woman. Um, and let's just say there's a, another young man, and he's you know he sees these two people who are dating. Well, he he gets jealous, right? So he wants to do something bad to that relationship. So let's just say he tries to um, goes up to that girl, and he's like, "Listen, you don't want to date this other guy. You don't want to be with him." You want to be with me. And um, he's trying to sabotage that relationship. Um, so that kind of jealousy is not good. It's not commendable. Okay. Uh, that's what the Judaizers were doing. Um, their motives are wrong. Because it says, yes, they want to exclude you that you may be zealous for them. So the purpose of for the Judaizers to exclude the Galatians is so the Galatians will be zealous for the Judaizers. And uh, so it's interesting that he wants to, so the Judaizers, you can see how they want to cut off this relationship with Paul and, of course, um, with Christ ultimately. But they also want to, um, they want to, the Galatians be zealous for them. And so uh, it just, you know, creates this strong attachment, right? And um, they're, they're enslaved. Uh, and that's the sad part about all this. Um, but in any sense, but it is good to be zealous in a good thing always, and not only when I'm present with you. So like I was saying, there's two types of zeal, right? There's the right kind of zeal to have, but there is um, zeal that they had, which was not good. Um, you know, I mean, think of another way of, of being zealous. Um, let me go to Romans 10 for a moment. Let's look at Romans 10, 1 through 3. What Paul says here, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. Okay, that's great. That's, But not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. You see, you've got to have that balance there. Is it right to have zeal that's properly motivated? Yes, but these Jews did not have the knowledge of the truth. And that's really sad. We have a lot of people in the religious world, in so-called Christianity, who, are, who have great sincerity, who are zealous for God, but they are not teaching the truth. And that's really sad when that takes place. Um, so he says, but it is good to be zealous and a good thing always. And not only when I'm present with you. Yeah. Um, that, that is exactly right. It shouldn't be just because Paul is absent, uh, that your zeal is gone. You should, you should have that proper kind of zeal. Then look at verses 19 and 20. My little children for whom I labor and birth again until Christ is formed in you. I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. So Paul wishes he could be with the Galatians, right? Paul has always been out to help them. Unlike the Judaizers, they don't help. They did not help them. They sadly brought them into bondage. Now, here's an interesting thing. Look at what how Paul illustrates this. He says, little children. Um, I love how Paul uses that uh, to describe his converts, right? Let's look at 1 Corinthians 4, 14 and 15. 1 Corinthians 4, 14 and 15. I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you, for though you have might have 10,000 instructions in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. So we're called little 
we're also called little children. Um, even John uses this phrase, right, in First John. So he says, My little children, for whom I labor and birth again until Christ is formed in you. Uh, so that's interesting um, that Paul is undergoing birth pain. So he's the, so to speak, the spiritual mother in some sense. So because of the Galatians' departure, Paul feels as if he's in labor all over again, waiting for them to re be reborn, to repent and come back to the gospel, right? It is a painful experience for a gospel preacher to see those he had taught turn from the truth. The person who loves the lost will be in travail when he's teaching them, right? But he is fearful that they will not obey the gospel. Well, and Paul, he's... He's going to experience this pain until the Galatians are indeed restored, right? Um, we we really do go through um, stress and turmoil and emotional pain when we see those who we converted to the truth turn away from the truth. So, um, so the, the extent to which Christ is formed in us reveals the extent of our faithfulness. So think about this. We're born again, right? Through, uh, as, as John 3, 3 through 5, we're born of water and the Spirit. Um, so we, uh, as First Peter 2 talks about, as newborn babes, you desire pure milk of the Word that may grow thereby. So we're constantly spiritually maturing, right? We're, we, we're born as a baby, growing as a child, and we're growing into a spiritual adult. So I hope that we're growing, really, and grounding ourselves in the faith. So this is that, and the birth pains metaphor shows that Paul's concern for follow-up is just as strong as he does desire to evangelize. And I think that is something that we have uh, certainly lost. We should never forget it is so important not only to help someone become a Christian, but to help somebody stay a Christian. So you have to do, there's a lot of follow-up work. Now, there are different ways to help somebody in the follow-up work. And that's where we can have these magazines uh, that brethren are translating into different languages. We have these videos for them to watch so that they can grow in their knowledge. We um, have a lot of tracks they can read, books they can read. Um, so we have to constantly give them tools they can use to help grow, um, but also to provide different avenues on which they can serve, um, whether that be some kind of benevolent work um, whether that be maybe a, a campaign where you uh, some uh, go out and try to invite people to a gospel meeting, for example. But it does indeed take, uh, you know, having that attachment. Uh, to, so that's something I, I really want to stress to everybody. I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. So, if Paul were there, he could be more effective in correcting them. Now, notice it says he had a change of voice um, and to change my tone. So, it may indicate a different way of handling the situation if he were physically with them, or that if he were physically with them, then they would not be in their present state, and thus that he would not have to confront them as he is doing now. So, uh, you know... There's in some sense, uh, there, there's an application for us um, with regards to social media. You know, I'll be honest. Social media is it's got its good things. It's got its bad things. The bad things is it's not always the best form of communication. Um, the best form of communication, of course, is that personal one-on-one, face-to-face. -on -face. Because you hear my voice, you hear my tone, you can see what how I feel towards you. With online, you just can't get that, that human interaction. And I think that's very important to how we 
uh, try to reach people um, when we're trying to help them to be co to be corrected. All right, moving on, Galatians four twenty one through thirty one. So Paul says, "Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, but he who was of the bondwoman was." Uh, uh, let me read this. Sorry, let me just read this from here. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise, which things are symbolic. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to the bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are born our children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh, then persecuted him, who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman within her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Now, why does Paul bring up this allegory? And I, I want to, uh, I think uh, one brother I listened to, on Galatians had a good point about this. Why, why would Paul bring this up? And I think one of the reasons that Paul may have brought this up um, is that the Judaizing teachers were saying, "Hey, uh, you Gentiles, if you are not going to be circumcised, then you're not children of the promise." But you are like Ishmaelites. You are, um, you are, you are, um, you come from Hagar. Um, so I think that's probably the reason Paul brings this up in some way. Um, saying that, hey, uh, if you are the Jews, are the sons of Abraham. And if you don't become a Jew, then you're not the sons of Abraham. So Paul takes this and he shows how the Judaizing teachers are wrong. So you have to understand that Paul's appeal is based on the account of Abraham's two sons, right? There's the facts of the account found in verses 21 through 23. Paul invites the Galatians' attention to what the law actually taught concerning the covenants. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? Like, if you if if you really go go back and hear what the law says, uh, and Paul addresses those who want to be under law. So you do want to be under the law, well, Moses? Do you? Do you not hear? Do you not listen to what the law says? They don't really understand what the law teaches because the law would actually point to Christ, right? If you go back under the law, it's actually going to point to Christ. That's what's in interesting. So Abraham's two sons had two mothers, different mothers, which affected each son's status, right? Ishmael was born of the bond woman, or the slave woman, Hagar. Isaac was born of the free woman, of Sarah. Abraham's two sons had different manners of conception. Ishmael was born according to the flesh by completely natural means. You remember that? Sarah said, hey, um, I mean, Sarah said basically to Abraham, listen, God's not fulfilling his uh, part of the of the promise he, he would say to you. So why don't you go over here to my handmaid, Hagar, and, and, and your seed will go through uh, her. And, Mary, and God had promised, he says, there's going to be an heir through your body, Abraham. 
Well, Isaac was indeed born through promise, just as a result of what God had promised to Abraham and Sarah. So this is an allegory based on that account. Now, it's an allegory that uh, has several comparisons based on true historical account. So that's something we need to rec recognize. When Paul, what Paul wrote in verse 22 and 23 cannot be denied, not even by the most militant Judaizer. Right? Likewise, by employing the Sarah Hagar narrative, Paul's objective was not to ex explicate some hidden allegorical meaning from the story. He does not claim that the historical account was written histor uh, allegorically, but rather he is treating it allegorically. Now, he has the right to do that because he is an inspired writer guided by the Holy Spirit. The details of the narrative simply correspond to the points he was seeking to make. Um, Holman Christian Standard Bible says these things are illustrations. So what are the advantages of Paul's use of this allegory? Well, it allows him to end on a final citation of the law of Moses that involves Abraham, Paul's primary example of faith and the promise. Remember, he talked about Abraham in chapter 3. It allows him to summarize all his main points. Law of Moses versus the faith versus the system of Christianity. Bondage versus freedom. Natural versus supernatural. It allows him to emotionally conclude to his formal argument and launch to a final personal appeal. It allows him grounds to suggest that the Galatians cast out the Judaizers, like chapter 4, verse 30 says. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Now, notice that these covenants are represented by Hagar and Sinai. The covenant is, sorry, the old covenant is represented by Hagar and Sinai. Mount Sinai is from where the Old Covenant proceeded, right? That's where we see God talk to, to Israel there at the mountain and give them the law of Moses through uh, the mediator, which is Moses. So the covenant binds them to be slaves. And that's what we see. Agar is Mount Sinai, and that she, like Mount Sinai, is a representation of the Old Covenant. Now, it's really interesting here. That Paul says, um, if you go to verse uh, 26, but the Jerusalem above is free, which, uh, sorry, for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. So, as the Old Covenant had once proceeded from Mount Sinai, had originated from Mount Sinai, so in Paul's day, it was proceeding from Jerusalem, the physical Jerusalem, in the form of the Judaizing teachers. Because we find that in Acts chapter 15, what, what were they doing? They were saying, unless you can be circumcised, you cannot be saved. So they're, the Judaizers are saying, all those who adhere to the Old Covenant, I'm uh, sorry, not the, uh, all, Paul's saying, all those who, who adhere to the Old Covenant, who are in league with the Judaizing teachers, are in bondage with all of Hagar's children. They are Hagar's children, the Judaizing, Judaizers are. So what is to be made of Paul's reference to Mount Sinai in Arabia? Well, since he spent time in Arabia, is he now pinpointing the geographical location of the, of the little mountain of Mount Sinai? Uh, and I'll be honest, uh, I've given a lot of thought to this question, and it's really difficult. Uh, let me just read some of the things here. Scholars have debated this question for centuries. Uh, there have been 13 places that have been identified as Mount Sinai. Um, so there are some who will say, well, the traditional Mount Sinai is Jebel Musa in the southern Sinai Peninsula. Um, some will point to Jebel El Laz in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> it's really hard to, to determine at, in the, at this point in our study. Um, but what's very important is that we see that the law of Moses came from Mount Sinai. So, um, so 
the covenant represented by the heavenly Jerusalem is contrasted with the covenant represented by the Jerusalem, which now is the Jerusalem, which is above those who truly belong to God through the gospel. Isn't that interesting? So you have, okay, physical Jerusalem uh, in Israel. That's the old covenant. But then there's the Jerusalem that's above that is now the mother of us all who are Christians. There's that heavenly Jerusalem. And um, very interesting enough, uh, we're running out of time, so let me give some more discussion to this in the next episode.